Ooh, that's a tough, <laughs> you know, I had to winnow the list down from 160 million to 101 to, 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 to pick three objects out of the, uh, out of, uh, the Smithsonian's collection is, is pretty uh, uh, difficult. And I had to argue long and hard with my colleagues at the Smithsonian, you know, to get, to get uh, any of them. So um, uh, uh, one that, uh, again, reflects my own career and, and my own inspiration is uh, one of the objects in the book uh, is Neil Armstrong's spacesuit. And why is that there? Why is that one of the objects I think is really tremendously significant in our, in our history? Well, one, this is, you know, we're in a space race with the Russians. President Kennedy had challenged us to go to the moon and back. And this was the spacesuit that Neil Armstrong wore to walk on the moon. He couldn't have survived unless he was wearing the spacesuit. So it, it represents a, a, a kind of tremendous victory in terms of the will of the nation to do that, to have a moonshot. It represents science and technology and engineering in terms of being able to devise a, a spacesuit that can enable a human being to, to first walk on the moon and survive. So it, it's great for that thing. It's also, I love it because there's an underlying story of creativity with regard to that spacesuit uh, that a lot of people don't know about it. We think of it as uh, just a you know, technological uh, innovation. But the real innovation was much more creative than that. When NASA was designing the spacesuit, uh, they first designed these spacesuits. They were very hard and shell-like. You couldn't move in them, you couldn't walk in them. And uh, so they had to rebid the, con the, uh, the uh, contract to produce the Apollo spacesuits, figuring that these guys are going to be bending down, they're going to be walking on the moon, they're going to be, you know, do doing work. So you needed something that had certain flexibility and certain movement capability. So they let the contract out. Who won the contract? The contract was won by International Latex Corporation, better known as Playtex. Why did Playtex win the contract to do the Apollo spacesuit? Because Playtex had <laughs> engineered the idea of layering and movement of flexibility in doing women's undergarments. <laughs> when you look at how those spacesuits were made, they were made by women at sewing machines. They were custom made for the astronauts and they were made so that they would have those flexibilities. So I, I, when I kind of think about it, I say, well, Neil Armstrong took, you know, it was a small step for man, a giant step for mankind, maybe even a better step for ladies' undergarments. <laughs> but it, it shows, it's a great American story because it shows that creativity comes out of all sorts of places we, we don't kind of, um, don't kind of uh, think about. Um, uh, one of the other objects in the book that I'm kind of pan, uh, uh, fond of are the pandas. And the reason I'm fond of the pandas is because they represented, again, uh, a good bit of cultural diplomacy uh, in terms of Richard Nixon opening up relationships with China, uh, going to China. We gave the Chinese muskox, we got the pandas, I think that was a good deal. Uh, and, um, but the pandas were not only to be cute and looked at in a zoo, and they're great stars and people follow the panda cams, and anytime the pandas go rolling in the snow, 60 million people go online and love, love, love to see it. But in getting the pandas, we were also accepting a challenge. And the challenge was about the preservation of species on our planet because the pandas were in danger. And it was really the Smithsonian scientists, and I know them personally, Joe Gale Howard and others no longer with us, who really figured out the nature of panda reproduction and how to save a species. And so when you think about it, the idea of having something in a museum collection that actually like, uh, 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 enabled life on this planet to persist and, 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 and to flourish. And now the pandas are, of course, off the endangered species list is, um, is pretty good. Smithsonian's had a lot, of, lot to do with that. Uh, a third object that's kind of talked about in the book, but it's one that's missing, actually, from the Smithsonian collection that I'd love to find. And I'm sure somebody has somewhere in America this object. It's called the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> So the one we have in the National Archive is not the original Declaration of Independence. That was one that was uh, 
calligraphed in uh, a Congress, the Continental Congress ordered it calligraphed in August. It wasn't signed by signers of the Declaration of Independence till October. We think one or two might have signed it in November, not July 4th, uh, 1776. This is our founding document. This is a document that declares that all men are created equal. This is a, a document that defined not only American democracy and liberty and freedom, but is used as inspiration for people the world over. The original document was uh, hand uh, written by uh, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin did some editing, crossed out a few words here and there, made it better. Jefferson was a bit chagrined. Uh, but the final version that they took to a printer, they were in uh, Philadelphia, uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, 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 in Independence Hall, and um, they took it uh, uh, about two blocks away to John Dunlop, a printer. And he's the one that set it in type, printed it up the next day, and that's the form of the Declaration of Independence that Americans had at that time, and we were colonial, still colonial British citizens. That's the one that circulated. It wasn't signed, it wasn't calligraphed, it was typescript and printed. But what did Dunlap do with those three pages that Franklin brought him that had the final version of the Declaration of Independence? That was the one that people voted on. That was the one that he and Jefferson and the, the committee had crafted. Did Franklin put it in his suit pocket, take it to France as ambassador and forget about it and leave it on a hanger somewhere in Paris? Did he give it to Jefferson and they put it in some trunk? Did Dunlop throw it in the waste bin? I doubt it. So that Declaration of Independence is a great treasure of American history, a foundational treasure of our country. That's in the book but I'd like to find it. <laughs> and my guess is somebody has that behind an old picture somewhere. It's stuck in some album. It's somewhere in somebody's basement or attic, somewhere. And uh, I would hope uh, that, that somebody can find that. And when they do, I am sure they're gonna wanna donate it either to the Riverfront Museum, if it's here in Peoria or in central Illinois. And if not, maybe they'll give it to the Smithsonian.